She's dead. Wrapped in plastic. Welcome to the Twin Peaks Podcast. Everyone, please take a seat. Okay, so now we're going to get to your feedback for uh, Firewalk with me. I don't even remember this movie. It's been so long. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Ugh, so many days in a week. Um, who, wants to, who wants to go first? I guess I can go first. It's right in front of me. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, everyone. I just woke up like six minutes ago. Okay. This one's from... Ben Villamek. And this one's kind of just on our podcast in general. Uh, hi guys. Great job on the mind blowing, mind blowingly amazing podcast. It's great to hear your thoughts on the show, and I love hearing the reactions from the first time viewers. As a huge Lynch fan, I thought I'd share a good source for insight into the Twin Peaks series in the movie and anything else Lynch did up to Lost Highway. It's a book called The Passion of David Lynch, Wild at Heart in Hollywood by Martha. Nickumson. It is a feminist view of his work, so you have to take everything with a grain of salt. But she definitely illumin- illuminates things in a way I probably never would have considered. She spends a good deal of time dissecting the finale and the changes to the series after Lynch's departure. And a lot of what she says makes a ton of sense. If you have a good library near you, they might carry this as I found mine in the library at my old community college. If you can't track one down there, it's available on Amazon, but I would only buy it if your interest in Lynch goes beyond just Twin Peaks. If you'd like, I could mail my copy out if you were unable to secure your own, but I doubt it would get to you before your next episode. (laughs) My question to you guys is a broad one. Do you like the fact that so much is left unexplained and is up for interpretation, or would you prefer that the show fleshed everything out more? Anyways, thanks a bunch for your podcast and all the hard work that's been put into it. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Thanks. So that one just came in between shows, and this has been the first opportunity to read it. It's not really about Fire Walk with me, but... So the question, do you like the fact that so much is left unexplained? Uh, Yes. Yeah, a lot of people do. I like it and I don't like it. (laughs) I think I've said that before. (laughs) Yeah, I'm of the same opinion. Yeah. (laughs) Caitlin, do you want to... Read uh, Seamus Kelly's. Sure. Well, howdy there, Twin Peaks podcast. So, fire walk with me. I went into this movie knowing what it would be a prequel, yet in its own small way, a sequel. I can say that I didn't have the overwhelming hate for that most do. The first 30 minutes or so, while well, strange, I was fine with. Call it lynch wackiness if you want, call it pure art, whatever it was, I enjoyed it. Especially with quite possibly my favorite moment David Gondam Bowie. <laughs> yes. No idea why he was there, but goddamn it was he was. <laughs> Has anyone ever asked him what he thought of filming with Lynch? Anyway, the main part. The story of Laura Palmer at first didn't hold much interest for me, but after reading the diary of Laura Palmer, the movie takes on a whole new life, and some of the things Laura says, like, I am the muffin, actually makes sense. Although out of context, it is kind of hilarious. Not only that, but the soundtrack for this movie, the physical CD itself, includes the full Under the Sycamore Trees, which alone makes this movie a blessing so that song could be released. But yes, all in all, the movie is an interesting film, but not the best Twin Peaks has to offer, but it expands the universe and the crazy mysteriousness, which I appreciate. So overall, I give this film 7 Bowies out of 10. Stay classy, Twin Peaks podcast. Thanks, Seamus. Yeah, it's very strange how uh, the uh, Under the Sycamore Tree song is on the movie soundtrack, and it doesn't appear in the movie at all, but I was happy that it was available. Do you guys like that song? Yes, I think it's my favorite. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. Good stuff. Give you a ghosties, Brad. Before a serial goes soggy. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> You're just getting the long ones out of the way, aren't you? <laughs> That's what we sound like, but we're muting it. So you know. <laughs> oh, keep reading. <laughs> Take your time. <clears throat> First, a moment of silence. Because you guys have just watched the last piece of Twin Peaks ever. Ah, we have had one. Okay, with that out of the way, let me just say that love it or hate it, Firewalk with me is an emotionally wrenching experience. For me, it only enhances what we've already learned about Twin Peaks, and in some ways it forces us to rethink the entire series. Let me just say that I like my Twin Peaks bleak and unforgiving, so Firewalk with me is everything this Dr. Jacoby ordered. Without going scene by scene, after all, that's your job. I'll just mention a few things. Number one. The first 20 minutes. When Lynch symbolically smashes a TV set at the beginning of the film, he shatters our expectations of the, about the film. We're presented with the anti-Twin Peaks in the town of Deer Meadow, where the diner food is lousy, the sheriff is an asshole, and the closest thing they have to the Great Northern is a local trailer park. A lot of fans hate this particular section, but I enjoy it. It was nice to see forensic specialist Sam, played by Kiefer Sutherland, who, in the pilot, Dale Cooper asked Diane not to put on the Laura Palmer case because Albert is a little more on the bill, a little more on the ball. By the way, just what did those teenage girls do to those kids on the school bus? Shudder. Mm. Number two, FBI headquarters. I hope after seeing all the crazy mayhem at the FBI headquarters that anyone who questions Cooper's methods will take notice. Take note of the kind of office shenanigans on display there. This is the kind of daily environment Cooper comes from. Security cameras caught in a time warp and vanishing David Bowie, etc. Enough said. Mm. And that makes me just question the whole FBI, not Cooper <laughs> less. <laughs> Number three, Moira Kelly. A new Donna! I had no trouble adjusting. Nor did I. Four, Laura's story. Cheryl Lee deserves some kind of award for this. She really does. This actress with almost an otherworldly kind of beauty is put through the ringer for the better part of this, of this film. In what must have been an exhausting performance, she manages to convey vulnerability, courage, and despair, sometimes all in the same scene. When Laura sees her father leaving the house and breaks down in denial, it's a truly heartbreaking moment and gives me chills every time. For my money, the saddest moment in the film is when Laura's angel disappeared from the painting. I remember sinking down in my seat in the movie theater and asking myself, Oh shit, this is really going to be rough. I know that there were fans who bemoaned the absence of their favorite quirky characters from the series, but we just went through a long stretch of episodes with nothing but quirky characters. And anyway, this is Laura Palmer's story, so I don't need them. I don't need to see them in this context. In my opinion, this is a remarkably powerful film, and it shifts the focus of the entire series back where it belongs: Laura and Bob. This is also a very important story for, with far-reaching ramifications to go beyond a groundbreaking TV series. Cheryl Lee has often mentioned how victims of, sex, of child sexual abuse by a parent or family member have approached her to say how they related to the Laura Palmer character. There's a horror story being told here, and it's one that's all too common. And despite the allegory of Bob and the fun of the quirky townsfolk, it's all too chillingly real. Ghosty. P.S. Hey, James wasn't too bad in the movie. Um, was, uh, maybe he was just barely in it. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't too good either. <laughs> he wasn't. He was whinier in yeah. the movie. He's easily forgettable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you want to take this one, Mel? No. Oh, no, no I'll paste no, it in no, there. No. <laughs> We're all done, all done our series. <laughs> I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> Great. Who's it's from Greg McCarran. Hello. Absolutely loving the podcast. Up to episode 10 so far. Wow. He's way behind. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> After stumbling upon it on iTunes, I only had the opportunity to start watching Twin Peaks in 2001, but completely fell in love immediately. The atmosphere of the show is so distinctive. Strangely comforting and chilling at the same time. Did you know that Piper Laurie guest starred in an episode of Will and Grace, playing a character that is very similar to Catherine Martell? Hmm, didn't know that. I stumbled across it one day and could almost pretend like it was like seeing Catherine alive, and well, af all after these years later, almost. 
She was probably my favorite character in the series, right from the pilot where she randomly fires that unfortunate worker at the bottom of the bill steps. <laughs> <laughs> also, I remember reading that Russ Tamblin re reprised his character of Dr. Jacoby in an episode of General Hospital, but my attempts to track down a clip have been fruitless, unfortunately. <laughs> well, they would be, considering that there's probably like a million episodes. Yeah. With Fire Walk With Me, I am a big fan. It is darker in tone than the series to be sure, but I feel like it is a great companion piece to Twin Peaks, fully exposing the dark undercurrent that ran through the TV series right from the start. I like to imagine that one day David Lynch will take all the hours of unused footage of Tw Peaks characters and intercut it into some kind of 25 years later movie to link it back to the original Red Room scene. Hmm. But I guess there's more chance of being in a nightclub and hearing a high-octane remix of Just You and I. <laughs> <laughs> Dubstep version. <laughs> <laughs> While I am not yet at, at the point to hear your thoughts on Firewalk with me, I'm really looking forward to it. And it's really great to hear the first-time reaction of Twin Peaks, of Peaks viewers as the plot unfolds and sometimes unravel. Especially since I seldom get the chance to chat to fellow fans. Really good job, guys. The podcast totally rocks. Thanks, Greg. Merci. We love uh, first-time uh, listeners, people that are trying to catch up. <laughs> well, cause what's going to happen, Matt, once... Are you going to, like, read, like, late time, like, you know, people that come into this later and send you feedback? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Just let feedback build up for a year. Yeah, and then that's <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's the 2015 edition. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> actually, here's another one. Hey, everyone. I actually just discovered you guys while I was sick. I must be sick in the head for missing out on all this awesome as it was happening. Zinger! <laughs> and I listened to quite a few of the most recent shows, but wasn't able to write in for your book review in time. You pretty much made me die laughing in your review episode, but on to the film. I've seen Firewalk with me several times, and I didn't fully appreciate it after getting the chance until after getting the chance to read the diary i feel as though david lynch's love for laura palmer as a character is evident throughout the film which i greatly enjoy so many small moments that it really only feel special if you both if you have both bookends to complement them the series and the book such as that meaningful almost confession like moment with donna the angels never come on for their, or her final meeting with harold he looks so cute with tears in his eyes <laughs> poor harold <laughs> Uh, Would you like him as he's being raped by Laura Palmer? <laughs> <laughs> Lord, no. Um, with her yellow teeth. <laughs> with her yellow teeth, yeah. Sadly for Laura, so many of those moments are just her alone, driven to the brink in her final days. Can we just say how truly frightening the movie is? That intro, when Chester disappears, always gives me the willies. Or Laura's dream about the painting. But I write you to discuss what I think is among the all the memorable things in the film the sole gem of them all that ending oh man what an emotional and beautiful image i know on youtube alone many describe and debate the ending as laura's entry into the white lodge some stating it is cooper guiding her to its entryway some saying the angel is a co is the concrete evidence of the shift to the white lodge but whatever your thoughts and please i want to hear all of your interpretations <laughs> i think we can all agree that it is a a peaceful, happy image of freedom and solace for such a d dark, hopeless, tortured young girl. Some might say Laura laughs in madness and disbelief at the thought of mercy for her soul, but I believe that her tears and overwhelming emotion at the sight of an angel, or heaven, or the end itself, is the single most moving image I take with me from my Twin Peaks experience. You do deserve peace, Laura, coupled with the beautiful score by Badalamenti. That scene song is The Voice of Love. I just love that song. It's one of my favorites, too. Uh, I just don't think there is a more perfect scene in the film. What did you all think of the ending, for that matter, of Laura's ultimate fate and her presence in the lodges? Can't wait to start at the beginning and hear all your past shows. Your newest fan, Rudy. Aww. Uh, P.S. Favorite piece of music from the score? Mine's The Pink Room. <laughs> <laughs> for me, the favorite piece of mu music from the movie is probably the final song, yeah. The, uh voice of love but my favorite piece of music on the soundtrack is uh it's sycamore fun. tree yeah sycamore trees which is just from the series but you guys have any thoughts on music or what you think the final image means 
I know. I think we talked about it last time, but you might have new. Yeah, I think we covered a bit. Um, yeah. You have any new thoughts on it? No, I didn't prepare new thoughts. Okay. okay. <laughs> I can hear you shuffling your papers, Brad. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> papers in his brain. <laughs> Homework. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite piece of music from the well, the movie? I don't know. I like I like a lot of it. It's all good. The whole soundtrack's pretty good. Okay. You want to take this one, Brad? It's a short one to make up for that long one you had to read. <laughs> hey, guys. So how do you like the movie? I enjoyed it. Thanks for asking. <laughs> yes. I think it's one of those movies that you enjoy a little bit more every time you watch it. I first saw this movie when I was in high school. My mom won tickets to a midnight preview screening of the movie and gave them to me. My best friend and I were huge Twin Peaks fans, so our parents let us go even though it was on school night. The movie terrified us. I actually had a nightmare of Bob that night. I still remember because it was the only time I ever woke up screaming out loud. Uh, Bob did his job. (laughs) Awesome. I loved the Chris Isaac character. I wish we could have seen more of him. I like to imagine he, along with Coop, Wyndham Earl, and David Bowie's character, have opened a Black Lodge branch office for the FBI. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Here's your spinoff right there. Yeah. Uh, Overall, I give this movie 8 out of 10 new and improved Donnas. Yes. <laughs> well, take care, and I hope you can cont- hope you continue podcasting. I really enjoy them. Heather. Thanks, Aww. Heather. Thanks. Here's one for you, Caitlin. From Mike, uh, Mike Dunbar. I almost called him Nike. <laughs> Nike. <laughs> I really love the way that Laura and Leland take the bulk of the mythos for this film. I think it makes the film a very human and personal story of abuse, and it can be viewed on those terms as well as any other. I only have a couple of issues with it, really. The first is that there was a large amount of footage cut from the final picture of the other people in Twin Peaks. This is fine, because it's a film, and if you weren't familiar with the series, then I can see how it'd be superfluous. Superfluous. <laughs> I can't say it. Uh, anyway. I think you got it the second time. Yeah, you did. The upshot of that is, however, that going to create link going to great lengths earlier to show us in the know how Deer Meadow is the polar opposite of Twin Peaks in every way and causing us to ponder why, but then not giving us a real Twin Peaks payoff is a bit disturbing. On that latter point too is my main problem. Twin Peaks doesn't feel like Twin Peaks. The weather looks like it's spring or summer, all bright blue skies, giving us the blue velvet look of idyllic suburban bliss, hiding a rotten core. But Laura was murdered in a chilly late February, which could have been sunny, but we never really see any sunny days in Twin Peaks. Not until the second season, at least. I know it seems like a silly complaint, but the show... But the show's credit sequences, all the shots of the wind in the trees, the dark nights, and so forth, those are Twin Peaks to me. And to have the bright sun bear down on us on every exterior shot just makes it seem a world away. That's true. Like, in the whole series, you never see snow. They're in Washington. It snows there, and it's February and March. <clears throat> Maybe David Lynch doesn't like snow. <laughs> Try to avoid it. Bizarre point to make, but there it is. I really do like the film, but for that kind of petty reason, it doesn't feel right to me. But then again, I love Gordon Cole's opening shot and David frickin' Bowie as Agent Jeffries. I also just want to add that I followed the cast from the first episode when I just happened to randomly type Twin Peaks Podcast into Google and you just started, and it's been a great journey with you watching the show again. I've moved on to the Carney cast now, too, and it's just kind of cool to be following your familiar voices on TV show journeys. I hope you keep finding it as fun as I do. All the best, Mike. Thanks, Yay. Mike. Yeah. Glad you're enjoying the Carney cast. <clears throat> I'll take this one, I guess. Or is it my turn? No, or are we you, taking turns? It, I've just been doing it randomly, I think. Oh. You can take it if you want. I think it's my turn. Okay. <laughs> From Justin Smith. Hey, Twin Peaks Podcast. I see you guys are about to review Twin Peaks Firewalk with me, and since you're interested in listener feedback, I thought I'd chime in to give my my two cents. While I was curious to see Twin Peaks Firewalk with me, I wasn't particularly excited to see it, mostly because the film was a prequel, and since the series ended with no real conclusion, did Agent Cooper escape the Black Lodge? It made no sense to me why Lynch would be given a character or a chance to create a movie to wrap up everything he wanted to say about Twin Peaks and use it to create a prequel about how Laura Palmer got killed, even though we know what the ending is. We know who killed Laura Palmer. We know how she died. We even know the locations and details as the police detectives have visited the places on the show. So my question was, what more could Lynch tell with this story that it would warrant this movie's existence? 
I'm happy to say I was somewhat blown away by it. Despite telling a story we already know, it managed to be a phenomenal experience. I love the beginning with Chris Isaac and a young Donald Sutherland. No. <laughs> really Sorry. Young Donald. It's a really young Donald Sutherland. <laughs> Spawn of Donald Sutherland. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Donald Sutherland, born in St. John, New Brunswick, our hometown, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's Whoa. <laughs> we can He's claim a- him. We can claim him. You can have him. We can. <laughs> he was born here, but he moved away almost immediately. Yeah. So there you go, because he saw how horrible it was yeah. as a toddler. <laughs> Take him back. Take him back. <laughs> yeah. We also we also have Louis B. Mayer from uh, MGM, one of the guys who made up MGM. Just saying. Matt, whatever. <laughs> My hometown has Wink Martindale. Ooh. <laughs> I don't know who that is. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so I love the beginning with Chris Isaac and a young... Uh, Kiefer Sutherland investigating a murder in a town similar to Twin Peaks. Harry Dean Stanton, one of Lynch's favorite actors, is worth watching in anything he is in, and the introduction to David Bowie's Philip Jeffries has to be seen to be believed. <laughs> it's true. I don't, I don't think it's perfect. Moira Kelly is no Lara Flynn Boyle. <laughs> no, she's better. Good for her. <laughs> <laughs> and watching her, it just didn't feel like I was watching Donna Hayward. Good for her. <laughs> well, you know, I agree with it for the first time I watched it, but then the second time I watched it, I was like, she's better. <laughs> <laughs> While it was great to have Agent Cooper back, it felt like he had too small of a part. And of course, we still don't have a proper explanation for the ending of season two. And of course, I still would have liked to see certain characters more often than others, Audrey Horn being high on my list. But I think I'm being unfair, as I'm basically saying I wish I directed the movie. And this movie had a lot going on. I'm grateful we had the chance to spend more time in the world of Twin Peaks and got to see this world with a larger aspect ratio, <laughs> as well as, <laughs> as spent time with the characters we did. Leland Pal- Palmer in particular stands out. It ranks up there among my favorite David Lynch movies, up there with Blue Velvet and Mulholland Drive, which puts it high among my favorite films list. Thanks for your great work on this podcast. It's the closest I'll ever feel to watching Twin Peaks on its original air date and makes me appreciate this world that much it makes me appreciate this world that much more. Here's hoping David Lynch and Mark Frost do return to Twin Peaks for the twenty fifth anniversary. Until then, let's eat some cherry pie with our black coffee. Om nom 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 nom. Thanks, Justin. <laughs> Merci. Merci Buku. Okay. <laughs> Let's play Tammy's audio feedback. Hey guys, this is Tammy. I just finished watching Fire Walk with me. Um, yeah, pretty dark. Uh, it followed the book, I thought, pretty well. Um, you know, well, well enough, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, just some craziness going on as far as her uh, when she realized that it was her father and at the end when he was saying how he thought that she always knew it was him I thought that was really sad because he thought she knew and yet he continued to molest her and oh it was so gross I just I felt so bad and what the hell was going on with Donna Um, I'm really glad that it was not Laura Flynn Boyle portraying Donna in this series um, or in this uh, movie because that would have been disturbing to see Um, and James oh oh, James what can I say about you except um, go away (laughs) Uh, yeah I mean you just kind of left Laura in the dirt nice classy oh and I felt so bad (laughs) Jacques tied her up and then Leo just left her Uh, so much so much going on so um, I am actually probably going to send you guys an email as well but thought I'd leave a voicemail alright talk to you guys later bye she sounded like she was very tired like it was a very late night that she she watched it (laughs) I think she watches these things late at night yes yeah it's the best time (laughs) yes also the worst (laughs) I'll read her uh, follow up email she sent hi Twin Peaks townspeople I'm going to try and keep this feedback brief, as I'm sure you have some deeper looks into the film in your inbox. Overall, I really enjoyed the film, but here's some notes. I didn't feel the intro with Detective Chet really matched the rest of the film, and almost could have been completely different. And almost could have been a completely different movie. 
although this was a nice reminder of what the show was, more lighthearted feel in some aspects, I thought the rest of the film was so dark that it was almost too large a contrast. I loved Lil the Dancer. (laughs) Chet is amazing to be able to figure out what that little dance meant, but I thought it was an interesting choice for Gordon to tell the agents about the case through alternative methods. Sure is. (laughs) Now Dale's craziness makes more sense. (laughs) No, it doesn't. <laughs> you know, the FBI as a whole d- makes less sense now. <laughs> uh, loved finally meeting Laura Palmer. That whole sequence with Bobby was amazing to show the various sides of her personality. Everything po- from popular girl to coke addict to cheater to master manipulator. Ray Wise equals awesome. He's so creepy. Okay, one of my favorite scenes was Donna getting into crazy shenanigans with Laura. I like this Donna a lot better than... LFB. She's <laughs> she just played the character more real to me. Like when she had the kissing audition, you can tell that she was trying to be a badass, but just wasn't. You could tell on her face what was going on in her mind. In the series, when Donna changes her personality between the two seasons, it was almost too jarring. Hmm. I I agree. Yeah. She put on those sunglasses, and then she's like, "Oh, I'm a badass now." And she was, <laughs> well, not really, but she, you could tell that she was actually like. A terrible person inside. (laughs) (laughs) I feel so bad for Laura when she starts to realize Bob is her dad. I thought Cheryl Lee portrayed Laura's range of emotions really well as she was figuring everything out, everything else. All the sadness, anger, betrayal, and eventual fear for her life. And watching her mom get drugged up so Leland could have his way with her, her was so disturbing. I was so grossed out by Jacques and Leo. They were just so disgusting. I couldn't believe they just left Laura tied up. The death scene was heart-wrenching. Laura looking into the mirror and seeing Bob freaked me out. I did enjoy the end where we see Laura in what I assume is the White Lodge and she's finally at peace. It's been quite a ride, Peeksters. Thanks for letting me tag along. Thanks, Tammy. No problem. Yeah, Tammy watched it for the first time along with us. I don't know how many other people did that. All the awesome people. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What about all those new awesome people? Mm. <laughs> Not so awesome. <laughs> Johnny come late, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one's from Brad Jr. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's really long, too. Here you go, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> Hello, folks. This feedback thing is a lot easier when there's, pl- when there's plenty you want to pick on, and I don't have much... Uh, And I don't have much I want to pick on, so let's try to cover the most serious stuff first. Incest is heavy. Man. (laughs) So, of course, a movie focusing on Laura Palmer was going to be darker than the series. Hmm. My hypothesis toward what makes the movie even tougher to take than expected is that I would say the movie tries to to tell its main story through two concurrent yet conflicting filters. The first and more comfortable filter is carried over from the show, the Lodge mythology, which in some way exonerates Leland's actions through possession. The devil made him do it kind of scenario. What we're going what we're going to do is ignore this mythology and see what's left. Repression and denial are pretty common survival tactics of victims of repetitive trauma. And for children such and for children such tactics can take on rather imaginative qualities. Could Bob be a fantasy creation of someone in Laura's position? A lesser evil to hide oneself a truth that is worse to bear? I think so. When we see Laura crying, no, 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 it can't be him, not him. I imagine that she has, she has had at this moment many times before. But this time it's different because it's the last time before she drops her defenses and faces what she's really, what's really been happening rather than pushing it back down from her mind. Oh, it's so long. We can, uh... We... Oh, don't even read it. No, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, take, we'll take turns. You can tag You can tag out at some point. Yeah, whenever you feel like it. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna power it. Let's see. <clears throat> all right, all right, I'm in this. I'm in the to win it. <laughs> Check this out. <clears throat> Certainly the drastic difference in between... Oh, already thwarted. <laughs> 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 Certainly the drastic difference in behavior from Ray Wise as Leland and Ray Wise as Bob, as it has been displayed in the series, has dissipated. 
when taking actions that we would attribute to Bob, Leland seems to be acting like Leland, and he feels a lot more culpable for the actions he would have simply blamed Bob for in the past. It's like there was a conscious decision for the movie to play the Bob aspect of Leland as the evil that men Leland do, rather than an inhabiting spirit, the evil men do. That's the that's an opening line from Swamp Thing. <laughs> In the film Swamp Thing, Ray Wise plays Swamp Thing. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? That's awesome. Yes. Oh, nice. I'm making that connection for everyone else. <laughs> um, from Leland's dying soliloquy in the series, it's easy to extrapolate that he was molested as a boy. We've all heard of the cycles of violence. That's a large percentage of abusers had themselves been abused. Leland continued the cycle to his daughter. This is the specific evil these characters do. Laura's ultimate decision in the movie is whether or not to continue the cycle of violence. Her choice is no. Unfortunately, but not unusual for those in departure situations, the only way out that she can find, the only way out she can see is to die. It's all very, very grim. But I also find it very, very moving. Before I move on, I want to say that Ray Wise is great in this tough role, and Cheryl Lee is amazing. She had me fall in love with her character in an instant. How she never became a superstar is beyond me. She's simply fantastic. Okay, now for the fun and other Lodge-related stuff. Brad, you shat bricks when you saw Heather Graham's name in the opening credits, didn't you? (laughs) Did I? I think I may have ignored it. You're not afraid of Annie? Yeah. (laughs) Well, I assume there couldn't be too much of her. Yeah. Yeah, and you were right. (laughs) And luckily I was very right. (laughs) Oh, no, I remember. I was blown... Uh, Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier... But when the movie started and the cast list was just going, mm-hmm. I was, my mind was being blown. <laughs> I know. Because <laughs> <laughs> David Bowie and... Keeper David Sutherland. Bowie, Keeper Sutherland. I'm like, what is happening? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. The first time we watched it, too, we were like, what? What? <laughs> what? 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 How is this going to work? I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Do you want someone else to take over the rest of the email? Sure. If someone wants to. <laughs> I'll, I'll take over. Where are we at? Uh... uh uh, I'm going to do the rest of Brad's email because uh, our Brad is dying. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Moira Kelly. You are a cool summer breeze wafting away the stench of Skeletor. <laughs> <laughs> Your character gets up to a bit of shenanigans I can't imagine the dawn of the series ever having done, but having you play it out instead of Skeletor kind of makes it easier for me to reconcile the discrepancies, so you get bonus points here. All I can think of now is, like, Lara Flynn Boyle speaking in a Skeletor voice. (laughs) (laughs) James Hurley! (laughs) We have to defeat (laughs) He-Man! That would have been way more delightful. Yeah. (laughs) The, Uh, The weakest scenes in the movie tend to be the ones that the series and the diary prepped for us but there's a lot of unexpected twisted stuff in this movie that's well exhilarating for me the scene that always comes to first to mind when i think fire walk with me is the philip jeffrey scene although i think david bowie's accent is unfortunate <laughs> how does anyone come up with I- ideas like this stuff with security camera with the security camera and you just know as this is going on that you're about to see all those otherworldly folk ah Oh, you should. Where's re- that? Uh... Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> like, you, oh, you should really read an early Firewalk with Me shooting script to see how Buenos Aires fits into all this. Uh, I think we mentioned that a little bit. Yep. Yeah. I thought the bit about Jeffrey's refusing to talk about Judy was a throwaway piece of dialogue the first five or so times I watched the movie. Then I realized what the monkey man at the end of the movie says. Judy. Ah, <laughs> my hot stinging brain. What does it all mean? <laughs> Oh, and you totally know Jeffries recognizes Cooper as Bob. For the scope and tone of the movie, I approve of the owls being replaced with electricity. Agree? Disagree? I didn't understand why they did it. <laughs> what owls? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm curious to hear everyone's thoughts about Chet Desmond. Do you think he's the closest thing to a normal FBI agent seen in the Ugh. Peaks universe? <laughs> you don't think so, Brad? I just hate him for his name. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, he's he's a normal FBI agent. Yes. His, his method is nose breaking. In case you don't know, in Coop's auto bio, Coop himself handled the bank, bank's investigation, but Kyle demanded his role sh- shrink to almost nothing. So voila, agents Des- Desmond and Stanley were created. Mm. Coop's just a liar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> I used to think the Blue Rose was related to Project Blue Book, but I reconsidered that. Coop knows about Cole's Blue Rose cases. 
So if the Blue Rose was related to Project Blue Book and the series of murders is Blue Rose case, then Coop wouldn't have been surprised by Project Blue Book being dragged into things in late season two, right? What do you guys think about the Blue Rose? Yeah, I thought it was Project Blue Book as well. If it's not that, then I have no idea. So the pedestal the ring sits on in Laura's dream, where the man from another place hands show it to Coop, is the same pedestal in the background when Bob takes Wyndham's soul, yes? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody told us to watch out for props. That must be it. That must be the one, yeah. I bet you guys caught this. Nope. <laughs> but I'm going to mention... I did. <laughs> did you? <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh, I guess he's talking about something else here, which we did catch. Oh. I bet you guys caught this, but I'm going to mention it just because I know many people don't catch this. The man Bobby kills is the deputy from Deer Meadow. Yeah, I caught that. Do you also know in the early draft of Firewalk With Me shooting script, we jump ahead to the end of the series? Yep, we see Annie being brought to the hospital and she has the ring. A nurse sees the ring and steals it, being drawn to it like she's Gollum. <laughs> I'm running so long. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, a dozen other things that bubble up for me. The symbolic break of the television at the start of the movie. Deer Meadow is an anti-Twin Peaks. Um, Was the school bus hijacked by prostitutes? Yes, it was. <laughs> Agent, <laughs> Agent Stanley greater than Jack Bauer. High school students dance in the missing sense as Bobby Watt walks into the school uh mise-en-scene what mise-en-scene 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 as <laughs> bobby walks into the school heidi has a bloody nose you didn't wash your hands the pink pink room sequence don't ever wear my stuff she should have explicitly mentioned her sunglasses <laughs> <laughs> leland versus the one-armed man at the intersection bobby you killed mike holy shit cream corn actually is pain and sorrow no wonder i won't eat it <laughs> Finally, I once read a story with that the ratings board was going to give Firewalk with me an NC-17 and that the filmmakers won the appeal by showing the board Maddie's death scene from the series, making the argument that nothing in the movie is as horrible as what's already been allowed on the television network television. Mm. It's a good story, but I doubt its veracity. Anyone hear this? Uh, thanks for all the good things you've done for your fellow Peaks Freaks. You're super. Brad Jr. Thanks, Brad Jr. Thanks, Brad Jr. Uh, thanks, Sana. Was- Thanks, son. <laughs> um, that, that's kind of interesting that he brought up the uh, the clothes, the sunglasses again. I never made the connection. Yeah, don't wear my stuff. Yeah, like. it's like it's like her stuff gives powers to people, yeah. sexy powers. <laughs> Do you want to take this one, Caitlin? Sure. Hi, Matt, Mel, Brad, and Caitlin. Well, I feel I should write in since this is one of my favorite movies of all time, and I'd like to share my experiences of seeing this when it was f- shown first run in theaters. Being such a fan of the series, I saw this on a Sunday of its premiere weekend, and there were only about ten people in the theater. Very disappointing, and not a good sign for any future Twin Peaks movies to come. As the movie started, I wasn't crazy about the opening half hour with Agent Desmond and Sam Stanley. I mean, who were all these strange unknown people, except Gordon Cole first, of course. I got more interested when the scene with Dale Cooper and Albert Rosenfield came on. However, there were three younger people in the front row of the theater that were snickering quite often since the movie started. And when the convenience store scene came on, I heard one of them saying to another, You were the one that picked this movie, and laughing quite loudly. That bothered me, and it took me out of the movie at that moment. I really wanted to like this, but I wasn't getting into it at all. But then Laura Palmer appeared and we were in Twin Peaks and suddenly we turned into some familiar territory. Yes, much of the humor wasn't there and many characters weren't around, but now I really got into it. Then we got to the roadhouse, Julie Cruz is singing and later when we got to the pink room scene, wow, what a trance this put me in. I noticed those young people in the theater weren't laughing anymore and they were quiet through the rest of the movie. The tension, the mood, what a grip this movie puts you in. At the end, I left the theater and felt my legs like my legs were made of rubber. I really felt like I went through the ringer, an old-fashioned term, but I don't know another way to describe it. I saw the movie two times, two more times in the three weeks that it was in theaters in my area near Cleveland. There were never more than 10 to 15 patrons. What a sh- such a shame. I began to like the opening Agent Desmond scenes more. It gets better after you've seen the movie a few times. I think I was too anxious for the Laura Palmer story and I wasn't interested in seeing those cold, unfamiliar characters at first. Now I realize that Lynch was contrasting the unfriendly Deer Meadow folks with the approachable, easygoing Twin Peaks citizens. Also, like all of Lynch's movies, I'm not sure that I liked it the first time, but as they settle in my head for a few days, I end up loving many of them. I still think this is his best, although I can see anyone who is not to... 
Peaks thinking otherwise. I realize I'm being very biased since Peaks is my favorite show ever. I remember in some interviews that Lynch claimed that you didn't need to be, you didn't need to see an episode of Twin Peaks to appreciate this film, but I find that hard to believe. Me Can too. anyone unfamiliar? Hmm? I said me too. <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone unfamiliar to the it relate to the scenes with the man from another place, Harold the Log Lady, the scenes in the Black Lodge? What would anyone think of all this with no lo- knowledge of the series? I think I would be completely like, lost and... Turn it off. I, <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd be put off or if I'd want to watch it again. That's a good question. What did everyone think of Maura Kelly as Donna? At first it's jarring, but I got used to her as it went on. Actually, I think she did a good job. I suppose if there was one actor replace, to replace in the movie, it would be Laura Flynn Boyle. Well, maybe I shouldn't have missed James Marshall either. <laughs> <laughs> Wish we saw more of the other characters, and I know there are many film scenes that were cut. If they do release those scenes on a special edition Blu-ray, I will break down and buy that Blu-ray player just to see them. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you guys will review the rest of the Lynch films. Just take your time with them and do one once a month or so. But whatever your plans are, I look forward to whatever you do for these next for these podcasts i hope they can continue in some form regards mark mcgilliot thanks mark <laughs> i love how he plans are <laughs> the, the rest of our podcasts for look us. here's what you're gonna do <laughs> what a month <laughs> it's, surprisingly, it's surprisingly similar to my real plan <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, sure your plan <laughs> <laughs> yeah matt you just made that piece of email beforehand <laughs> you're just trying to make sure he doesn't get his cut all <laughs> yeah. the sweet sweet podcasting dollars yes <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, we're rolling cash at this very <laughs> Okay, do you want to take this one, Mel? Sammy Carter? Sammy Carter. This is from Sammy. Here are my first impressions from when I saw the film when it originally was in theaters. I had no idea where the film was going to pick up. I saw no previews or read any- anything about the film. I thought it would pick up with Dale in the Black Lodge. Man, was I ever wrong. Seeing Teresa Banks' floating down river told me it was going to be a prequel. When the movie got up to the Blue Rose scene, I knew the movie would be pure lynch. I was really glad I read The Secret Diary of Laura Palmer and watched the film two more times. Then I really enjoyed the film, but still had many questions. Like, why the old lady and grandson have different names from the TV series? I think they were just pretending to be... Different people. Yeah, different people. Yeah. So they couldn't be traced. Yeah. The rings. What is up with the rings? Does the ring prevent Bob from taking over the person wearing the ring? When Mike tosses the ring into the train car and Laura puts on the ring, Bob gets really upset. Did Mike know that Leland was Bob? It sure looks like it in the traffic light scene. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure you will have all the answers, so I'll just wait for the podcast for enlightenment. Thanks, Sammy. Yeah. (laughs) We don't have one from Claire. (gasps) <gasps> Claire? Claire, you never sent it. Well, she was on the show, so... Oh, yeah, that's true. Never mind. <laughs> I guess that's, that's... She's given her thoughts. She's had her time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. All right. Uh, greetings from Finland, everyone. I, I don't see who this is from, actually. Uh, it's from... Pali Sitala? I don't know how you would say that, pronounce that. There's, like, little... Pali Sitala. There's, like, little dots on the A's. I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Maybe it's Pauli. Pauli? I don't know. Pauli Satala. Um, first, I must apologize for my bad English, but I'll try my best to write my feedback somewhat coherent for you. So here goes. That was pretty coherent. Uh, I'm impressed that he knows the word coherent. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've been a huge fan of Twin Peaks and David Lynch for quite some time now. The first David Lynch film I ever saw was Dune. Oh, that sucks. And I know that some people really don't like that film, including Lynch himself. But I love that film. Shortly after that, I watched all of his films and I fell in love with Lynch's style of filmmaking. Twin Peaks has been one of my favorite shows of all time, and when I discovered your podcast, I immediately got hooked in. Hearing the thoughts of some people that had never seen the show before was really interesting to listen. Uh, I found myself laughing many times at your hilarious observations of the show that I hadn't noticed before, especially Brad's comments on the show had me laughing many times, and his Morgan Freeman impression is awesome. (laughs) Now, after listening to your podcast, that I'll I'll have to agree with you, Harry is a terrible cop. (laughs) I'm still still amazed that I hadn't noticed it before. I know, us too. (laughs) Now that you're finished with the series, I am waiting anxiously to hear your thoughts in Firewalk with me. I myself did enjoy Firewalk with walk with me at, at all the first time I watched it. It used to be the only Finch... Finch. used to be the only Lynch film that I hated. 
now I don't have that kind of harsh feelings towards it, but the reason I think I absolutely hated it the first time was because I had just finished watching the series, and of course, like most of the fans, I was angry at the series ending. I was yelling at my television, and I was furious. One of my favorite characters in film and television history had lost his soul to Bob, and I was devastated. It took me a while to get over the ending, and to realize that realize what an amazing episode it had been. It wasn't a good idea for me to watch the film when my mind was in that kind of state, but I still did. See, um, to oppose this, one of my favorite characters <laughs> got picked up a soul <laughs> from a character I didn't quite like. Yeah. Uh, uh. He made a good in this transfer. Mm. This deal. When I watched the film for the first time, I missed most of the characters from the show. Pete, Audrey, Ben, etc. The film had totally different feeling to it. I didn't have... It didn't have any of the humor that the series had, and that's why I didn't feel like the show. It didn't feel like the show for me. I thought the whole film was pointless because we already knew what had happened to Laura Palmer through most of the conversations in the show. I always thought that the murder of Laura Palmer was more terrifying when you imagined it yourself. But now that some time has passed, I'm actually starting to like the film a bit more. It isn't Lynch's best film, but it isn't as bad as some people say it is. Anyhow. Matt Mel, Brad Caitlin, keep up all keep up the good work and may a smile be your umbrella. We've, we've, we've all had our socks tossed around. <laughs> Catch you later. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Is that from something? Uh Polly S. Maybe it's a uh, a finished saying. Maybe. <laughs> uh, we've all had our socks tossed around, I know that. <laughs> oh. PS Brad's seen the video of Frank Silvi posted on your Facebook wall. I don't think so. It's it's of him. I think it's him at a festival reciting the full uh, "Fire Walk with Me" poem as it appears in the European pilot. Oh, nice! I'll have to go check that out. Yeah, we we need to Google that. The socks what? tossed around oh, thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so w- that's a Twin Peaks quote. Come on, guys. Probably. <laughs> um, what did you guys think? Uh, I know you guys liked the movie, but would you have preferred a movie that continued on rather than telling the story we already knew? Oh, it was Gordon Cole's line. <laughs> I just Gordon? remembered, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's why it was all written in all caps. <laughs> I just forgot about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so what do you guys think? Would you rather a movie that had continued, or even though you liked this film? Right. I mean, can I have both? Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> no. The, that was the plan, yeah. Um, Caitlin? I know before I said that I wanted to have something that continued and know what happens next. But I'm actually now thinking that I, I rather like where they left it and with the suspense of the whole Cooper situation. And mm. I actually, I prefer that it didn't continue. Okay. All right. So that's all of them. Thanks everyone for your feedback. What are we going to re- do next? I think we're reviewing, do you guys want to review uh, the Cooper book next? Have two or three weeks to read that or, or a month or a month. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do that. Sure. Yeah. 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 Do you guys have access to it? Um. Yeah. Matt sent a PDF. Oh. Okay. I know it kind of sucks reading a whole book as PDF, but. I've done it before. Yeah. It's not that bad. Well, at least for me. I wish they would re-release it. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe someday. Well, yeah. if we do just, a podcast about it, they might. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Put it on the Kindle. It looks beautiful. Oh, can you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, ah, nice. cool. Yeah, I can put mine on my Kobo. Looks fine. Oh, cool. That's great. We're not up with that newfangled yeah. technology. <laughs> Oh, it's the best. So I have old, old actual books. Yeah. <laughs> I've also read PDF books on my computer before, and it's, it's it still goes quickly, I think. They just like... gotta turn the brightness down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, so thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time, whenever that ends up being. But we will be back. Okay, bye. Bye! bye. <laughs> we will return! <laughs> 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 Thanks for listening. Check us out on twitter.com slash twinpeakscast. Search for the Twin Peaks Podcast group on Facebook. And visit us on twinpeakspodcast.blogspot.com. Email your feedback to twinpeakspodcast at gmail.com.
Here's a tune for you guys. Okay. Don't do anything I wouldn't do.